Father and Mother. How can children repay parents for their watchings, anxieties, labors, toils, trials, patience, and love? Think of the utter helplessness of the long years of infancy, of the entire dependence of succeeding childhood, of the necessities and wants of youth, of the burning solicitude of parents and their deep and inexhaustible love. Think of the long years of unwearied toil of their deep and soul-felt devotion to the interest of their offspring of the majesty and matchless power of their unselfish affections, and then say whether it is possible for youth to repay too much love and gratitude for all this bestowal of parental anxiety. Oh, what thankfulness should fill every child's heart. What a glorious return of love. Every day should they give them some token of love. Every hour should their own hearts glow with gratitude and holy respect for those who have given them being and love them so fervently and long. Nothing will so warm and quicken all the affections of the parent's heart as such respect. Who feels like trusting an ungrateful child? Who can believe that his affection for any object can be firm and pure? The child who has loved long and well his parents has thoroughly electrified his affections, has surcharged them with the sweet spirit of an affectionate tenderness, which will pervade his entire heart and will make him better and pure forever. The affections of such a child are to be trusted, as well may one doubt an angel as such a one. There is always a liability where sons and daughters have gone from the home of their childhood and have formed homes of their own, gradually to lose the old attachments and cease to pay those attentions to parents who were so easy and natural in the olden time. New associations, new thoughts, new cares all come in, filling the mind and heart, and if special pains not be taken, they thrust out the old love. This ought never to be. Children should remember that the change is in them and not with those they left behind. They have everything that is new, much that is attractive in the present and bright in the future. But the parents' hearts cling to the past and have most in memory. When children go away, they know not and never will know until they experience it themselves, what it costs to give them up nor what a vacancy they left behind. The parents have not, if the children have, any new ones to take the place of the old. Do not then heartlessly deprive them of what you still can give of attention and love. If you live in the same place, let your step be, if possible, daily, a familiar one in the old home. Even when many miles away, make it your business to go to your parents. In this matter, do not regard time or expense. They are well spent. And some day when the word reaches you flashed over the wires that your father or mother is gone, you will not regret then the many hours of travel spent in going to them while they were yet alive. Keep up your intercourse with your parents. Do not deem it insufficient to write only when something important is to be told. Do not believe that to them no good news is good news. If it be but a few lines, write them. Write it, if it only be to say, I am well. If it be only to send the salutation which says they are dear, or the farewell which tells them that you are affectionate still. These little messages will be like caskets of jewels, and the tear that falls fondly over them will be treasures for you. Let every child having any pretense to heart or manliness or piety and who is so fortunate as to have a father or mother living 
consider it a sacred duty to consult at any reasonable personal sacrifice the known wishes of such a parent until that parent is no more and our word for it the recollections of the same through the after pilgrimage of life will sweeten every sorrow will brighten every gladness will sparkle every teardrop with a joy ineffable there is no period of life when our parents do not claim our attention love and warmest affections from youth to manhood from middle age to riper years if our honored parents survive it should be our constant study how we best promote their welfare and happiness and smooth the pillow of their declining years nothing better recommends an individual than his attention to his parents there are some children whose highest ambition seems to be the promotion of their parents interest they watch over them with unwearied care supply all their wants and by their devotion and kindness remove all care and sorrow from their hearts on the contrary there are others who seem never to bestow a thought upon their parents and to care but little whether they are comfortably situated or not by their conduct they increase their cares embitter their lives and bring their gray hairs with sorrow to the grave selfishness has stilled their hearts to the whispers of affection and avarice denies to their parents those favors which would materially assist them in the downhill of life others too by a course of profligacy and vice have drained to the very dregs their parents cup of happiness and made them anxious for death to release them from their sufferings how bitter must be the doom of those children who have thus embittered the lives of their best earthly friends there can be no happier reflection than that derived from the thought of having contributed to the comfort and happiness of our parents when called away from our presence which sooner or later must happen the thought will be sweet that our efforts and our care smoothed their declining years so that they departed in comfort and peace if we were otherwise and we denied them what their circumstances and necessities required and our hearts did not become like the nether millstone our remorse must prove a thorn in our flesh piercing us sharply and filling our days with regret there is an enduring tenderness in the love of a mother to her son that transcends all other affections of the heart it is neither to be chilled by selfishness weakened by worthlessness or stifled by ingratitude she will sacrifice every comfort to his convenience she will surrender every pleasure to his enjoyment she will glory in his fame and exalt in his prosperity if misfortune overtake him he will be the dearer to her from misfortune and if disgrace settles upon his name she will still love and cherish him in spite of his disgrace if all the world besides cast him off she will be all the world to him a father may turn his back on his child brothers and sisters may become inveterate enemies husbands may desert their wives wives their husbands but a mother's love endures through all in good repute in bad repute in the face of the world's condemnation a mother still lives on and still hopes that her child may turn from his evil ways and repent still she remembers his infant smile that ever filled her bosom with rapture the merry laugh the joyful shout of his childhood the opening promise of his youth and thinking of these she never can be brought to think him all unworthy young man speak kindly to your mother and ever courteously and tenderly of her but a little while and you shall see her no more forever her eye is dim her form bent and her shadow falls graveward others may love you when she is passed away a kind-hearted sister perhaps or she whom of all the world you choose for a partner she may love you warmly passionately children may love you fondly but never again never while time is yours shall the love of a woman be to you as that of your old trembling mother has been 
Alas, how little do we appreciate a mother's tenderness while living. How heedless are we in youth of all her anxious tenderness. But when she is dead and gone, when the cares of the coldness of the world come withering to our hearts, when we experience how hard it is to find true sympathy, how few love us for ourselves, how few will befriend us in misfortune. Then it is that we think of the mother we have lost. The loss of a parent is always felt, even though age and infirmities may have incapacitated them from taking an active part in the cares of the family. Still, they are rallying points around which affection and obedience and a thousand tender endeavors to please concentrate. They are like the lonely star before us. Neither its heat nor light are anything to us in themselves, yet the shepherd would feel his heart sad if he missed it when he lifts his eye to the brow of the mountains over which it rises when the sun descends. Over the grave of a friend, of a brother, or a sister, we would plant the primrose, emblematical of youth. But over that of a mother, we would let the green grass shoot up unmolested. For there is something in the simple covering which nature spreads upon the grave, which well becomes the abiding place of decaying age. O oh, a mother's grave, it is indeed a sacred spot. It may be retired from the noise of business and unnoticed by the stranger, but to our heart how dear. The love we should bear to a parent is not to be measured by years, nor annihilated by distance, nor forgotten when they sleep in dust. Marks of age may appear in our homes and on our persons, but the memory of a beloved parent is more enduring than that of time itself. Who has stood by the grave of a mother and not remembered her pleasant smiles, kind words, earnest prayer, and assurance expressed in a dying hour? Many years have passed, memory may be treacherous in other things, but will reproduce with freshness the impressions once made by a mother's influence. Why may we not linger where rest all that was earthly of a beloved parent? It may have a restraining influence upon the wayward, prove a valuable incentive to increased faithfulness, encourage hope in the hour of depression, and give fresh inspiration to Christian life. The mother's love is indeed the golden cord which binds youth to age. And he is still but a child, however time may have furled his cheek or silvered his brow, who can yet recall with a softened heart the fond devotion or the gentle chidings of the best friend that God ever gave us. Round the idea of mother, the mind of a man clings with fond affection. It is the first deep thought stamped upon our infant heart when yet soft and capable of receiving the most profound impressions. And the after feelings of the world are more or less light in comparison. Even in old age, we look back to that feeling as the sweetest we have ever known through life. Our passions and our willfulness may lead us far from the object of our filial love, we may come even to pain their heart, to oppose their wishes, to violate their commands. We may become wild, headstrong, or angry at their counsels or oppositions. But when death has stilled their monetary voices and nothing but silent memory remains to recapitulate their virtues and deeds, affection like a flower broken to the ground by a past storm lifts up her head and smiles away our tears. When the early period of our loss forces memory to be silent, fancy takes her place and twines the image of our dead parents with a garland of graces, beauties, and virtues, which we doubt not they possessed.